certain things. And if you do have a bulletin, uh, we got twofold, the, the twofold reason to pray for our leaders and that, you know, that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life out of 1 Timothy chapter 2. And secondly, that it honored the Lord. It honored the Lord, uh, for us to do that. Uh, he sees what's going on. And the best way to live in natural freedom is to learn how to live in spiritual freedom. People who are free in their hearts have the conviction of wanting to be free in their bodies and to preserve that freedom at all cost. And uh, it's a mindset that is it is not unique to America. Uh, it is to a lot of people. And when you get enough of those who are willing to do that, uh, it's a risky business. Freedom is a risky business. But uh, it's something that uh, we have. All right. And also the third question we had is what effect on others transpires if men refuse to fight when freedom or women when freedom is in jeopardy? Well, it makes other people skittish and disheartened if you're not willing to. By what means can God turn the tide of public opinion? Well, a positive believer. And we use Daniel in Daniel chapter 3 in the beginning of Daniel chapter 4, where those three young men who were willing to go into the fiery furnace and did go because they wouldn't bow to King Nebuchadnezzar. And when King Nebuchadnezzar saw that fourth image in there, the Lord Himself was in there protecting those young men, and they did not get burnt or singed by the fire. God supernaturally protected them. It changed the king's mind. You can change people's minds. You might think, uh, I'm not going to change anybody's mind. You can change people's mind by how you live. That you have something that, that gives you a conviction that is a good conviction. A hearty, godly conviction. And it has to start somewhere. And sometimes you're the only person that really can get that going in your workplace or in your home to, to, to be the person that's going to say, I'm going to do the right thing. It's not going to be easy, but I'm going to do the right thing. And you can be a great encourager to others by doing that. And you'll have God on your side and things that He can do to take up the gap for where you and I come up short sometimes. Because we all come up short sometimes in our ability to do what we'd like to do, even if it's a righteous thing. We kind of come up short sometimes. I get great ideas, but I come up short sometimes. Sometimes we just have to pull our resources of our mind and our talents together and make it happen and then ask God for His guidance. We looked at the objective of justifiable war, and that is to bring peace to your people. You're not going to bring peace to the enemy. You're going to bring war to the enemy, but you want to bring peace to your people. You want to secure peace for your, your family and your community or your nation. You want peace for it. And we last, the last question is, what is the most merciful method for securing peace? A forceful, decisive, quick, merciful victory. Overwhelming force as quickly and as decisively as possible. That's the most merciful thing you do other than having an 18-year-old war. Do it, get it over with, and make such an impact that you are a deterrent. Piddle, paddling around, negotiating, talking, back and forth, making deals is not how you get wars over. You go in, you blast the hell out of them, and you leave a big hole in the ground so that everybody can stand around and watch and say, I don't ever want that to happen to me. That's how you do it. Until then, you're going to have blood being trailed across the seas and sad ceremonies and draped coffins coming off of C-140s or C-130s or C-5As. That's what you're going to have. Get it, get it done and get it over with and get home. That's the most merciful thing that you can not only do for your country, but for another country. Be merciful. That's the way you do it. That's the way the Bible teaches it. And we discussed that in Sunday school. And we didn't have any coffee to go with that. Now it's round two. Preserving peace. You got it? What you going to do with it now? You got it? What you going to do with it now? Newt Gingrich 
wrote a book several years ago, Rediscovering God in America. It's a small book compared to some that we have. But I want to read just a little bit out of one of the chapters and his conclusion on this book. And he talks about all the monuments in, around Washington, D.C., and all the scriptures that are inscribed on those granite pillars over the Supreme Court, over the Treasury Department, and other areas where there are scriptures inscribed on those monuments and on those federal buildings. He says here regarding the where the, the National Mall is, where the reflecting area is there. It is poignant that the first rays of sun that illuminate our nation's capital each morning first fall upon the eastern side of its tallest building, the 555-foot monument to the father of our country. And there on its top, inscribed on the eastern side of the four-sided aluminum capstone, are the Latin words, Laus Deo, praise be to God. These simple words placed where they are for the eyes of heaven alone to see are a fitting reflection of George Washington's deep conviction that the securing and maintaining of American liberty is owed to divine blessing for which all Americans should humbly give thanks. And it gives a whole lot of other stuff in here that I just don't want to get into this morning. That's not all of what I wanted to say. But I wanted to say this today, that this Sunday we honor those who have given their lives in defense of our freedom to have what we have. What we are doing this morning in many countries is outlawed. Our point of view is outlawed when it comes to the divine point of view, or at least it's not protected. It's attacked. If it were not for those who fought and died, which is Memorial Day Remembrance not just for all military, but it's specifically for those who didn't come back. If it were not for those who fought and died in defense of our freedoms or the pursuit of bringing freedom to those who were oppressed in other countries, then we would probably not be assembled here today, at least in this form or fashion. We might be like so many countries today where the Christian faith is outlawed. And I, you can go online... I'd ask that you don't do it right now and Google this, but there are nations where the Christianity and the Bible are uh, illegal to, to have or to practice. Jesus Christ, yes, is our Savior. And because He is the Savior of so many Americans, we must defend our greatest freedom, which is to worship. And yes, freedom of speech is a part of worship. And when freedom of speech is taken, freedom to worship is taken as well. Freedom to preach what the Bible says is taken as well. It is not offensive when God's Word says it's good for you. It is offensive when wicked people don't want to do it. That's when it's wicked. And people who do not want to repent will perpetuate a wickedness. At least some do. And so we must defend our greatest freedom to worship God in His name. We must be able to continue to seek His truth so that we may remain free in our souls, firstly, which also will motivate us in our conscience to remain free in our person or in our bodies. You must be free first, and truth will set you free, John 8.32. Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The word freedom there means to be liberated, not to be in bondage to fear, not to be in bondage to addictions, not to be in the bondage to uh, an abusive spouse or an abusive person, but to be free in your soul, which will motivate you to be free with your body. That is to be in freedom, not to be imprisoned, not to be chained, not to live in fear. We must support those then who defend our right to assemble, as we have brought up before from Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. So I'll ask you to turn there just for a moment. Romans chapter 13 in your New Testament. Paul wrote this. Romans 
chapter 13, familiar. We went just briefly on a few things, and we'll just briefly go over this a little bit again. But we need to support those who defend our right to assemble for worship. And that's not just militarily, but also the police force. If it should become unruly so much so that we cannot have a worship service in here, I will call my friends at the Bottica County Sheriff's Office 3.6 miles from where I'm standing, and they'll be here in short time. Because we have a right to assemble peacefully. And we will. I won't be like some mayors or some governors and roll over. We must support those who defend our right to assemble for worship. It is that important. For some people, church is not important. But for those who are saved, who know Christ as Savior, there is a sense in our spirit of devotion to Him that is stronger than really actually any other devotion that we have. It's actually stronger than the bond that we have within our marriage because it is what ties us with our Creator. And in doing so, when we have that acknowledgement and that appreciation, we have the same for our fellow man, especially our spouses and our friends. Romans 13.1 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Now, the laws that Paul got came from Jesus Himself. Galatians chapter 1 and 2 tells us that Jesus received the revelation from God for how we ought to live our life as Christians from Jesus Christ Himself. Paul's not making this stuff up because he's prior military and prior Pharisee. He's making this stuff up. He's not making it up, but God's giving it to him. Let every soul be subject. Present, middle, imperative. Imperative is a command in the Scripture. That's a verb there, be subject. Submit to. Middle voice is also in that word the way it's originally written, so you're to participate in it. Un- subject unto the higher powers. Now, there are always exceptions for when it comes to moral reasons. You're asked to do something immorally. That's different, but still. Subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. Powers that be, that is ordained government powers, they are ordained of God. Human government began in Genesis chapter 9. God ordained that there be human government for the protection and the preservation of nations. Whosoever therefore the resist that power, that is ordained authorities, is resisting the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves, well, judgment. There's a penalty associated with it. For rulers, that is authorities that have bona fide authority positions, not vigilantes. For rulers, according to the word of God, are not a terror to good deeds or good works, but to evil deeds or evil works. Well, at least they're supposed to be unless they're in bed with them. Will thou then not be afraid of that power, their authority? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have the praise of the same. For that he is a law enforcer. The law enforcer is the minister of God, whether it's in the military or it is in the police force. They are ministers of God to thee for good. And too many are losing their lives doing their job. And just because there's a bad apple or two, and we know that there are, whether it's in the military or in the police forces around America, at the percentage of bad apples is pretty low considered to, in comparison to the percentage of the public that they have to deal with. He's the minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he does not carry that Glock 9 for nothing. He does not carry that for nothing. He does not carry the sword in vain. He is the minister of God. He is an avenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Because they're supposed to protect and serve, whether it's in the military or it is on the police force. That's what they're supposed to do. And that's what most do. 
Therefore, you must needs be subject not only for for wrath, but also for conscience sake. That is not just that you don't want to have to pay the penalty or pay the fine or do the time. But you want your conscience to be clear with your almighty maker, with God. And for this cause, pay you tribute also, honor also, for they are God's ministers. Not talking about preachers, talking about those who, who conduct the affairs of helping to have an orderly society. Who are attending continually upon this very thing. Therefore, render to all their dues, tribute to him, tribute is due. Custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Father, we ask you to help us with the word this morning. Help us to understand that none of us are perfect. We all fall short of your glory, and only Jesus Christ has done all that's necessary to provide our eternal redemption through his shed of his blood on the cross of Calvary. Father, we thank you that he's done for us what we could not do for ourselves and that you have taken up the slack for that which we are incapable of paying for our salvation, and that is through the blood of Christ, through his sacrifice for our sins, to satisfy your just demands that have been broken by every one of us through our sin. We can't fix it, but Christ did, and we're so thankful. And Father, we thank you that you ordained human government, though many are corrupt and none are perfect, even the best are not, We thank you that you did ordain and orchestrate a system in your word to give us guidance with moral laws, just and right treatment, and for our day, that which we can understand and deal with by your grace, how we're to handle law offenders and how we are to handle our enemies overseas. And so we ask for your mercy, Father. And dealing with things that need to be dealt with, we do pray for our leaders. We ask now for your strength and again for a little more grace and peace and understanding as we go into the Bible a little bit more this morning. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. What I read from Romans 13 is just to help us to understand that God expects us to be in support of those who defend our rights and our freedom. And we never have a right to infringe on the right of another person. That's a right that you don't have, and that's why you have to have a go-between to protect you. Forget about the financial prosperity America stands to lose if we lose our freedom. Consider what it takes to make that freedom to be prosperous possible. If it were not for national peace, most likely none of our personal prosperity would exist. I'm going to say that again. If it were not for national peace, which has to have an enforcement force, whether military or police, if it were not for our national peace, there's a very good chance that none of us would own personal property. And more likely, fear would rule our communities and our hearts more than joy ruling our communities and our hearts. Because men desire peace and safety to raise their families, they must defend that peace at all costs which God commands. Men and women both defend that cost and that peace at all costs. And because you desire peace and safety to raise your family, you must be willing to defend that peace at all costs. And God sanctions that. No need to have war guilt or protecting the family guilt if you have to do something extreme at times, if you're doing something to protect and to preserve. No need to feel guilt over that. Seeking international unity has led naive men and women to work for world peace. And I wish we had world peace, but we know better. Oftentimes, that peace comes at the sacrifice of our national freedom or our national security. But if we have to sacrifice the peace of God found in Christ, then we will have no peace at all as Christians. We can't afford to let that happen. We've been sold a bill of goods that all wars are wrong. We talked about justifiable war a little bit this morning. 
We won't get into that too much today. But we've been sold a bill of goods that all wars are wrong, that no nation of people is worth fighting and dying for. Well, there's a word for people like that. They're called cowards. It is worth fighting for. If you don't have a backbone, people will walk all over you. And it takes a backbone to build a nation. It takes conviction to build a nation. And if you're just looking for a handout, and all you want is leisure, then you won't care what people do to you as long as you keep getting the handout and are given the ability to have the leisure that you want. Well, that's not freedom. That's slavery. That's bondage. Because when you lose that handout and you lose that leisure of whatever it is, then you got nothing but starvation on your hands. We're not supposed to sit around waiting for people to do for us. We're supposed to do for ourselves. A lot of people don't fight for freedom because they got nothing to fight for or they've got nothing to fight with. When our nation was going through its most historic time of economic suffering during the Great Depression of the 1930s, men, women, and children were living from hand to mouth. Whether you had an education or you came from money or not, it wasn't any good anymore. Very few survived that. Very few with jobs. Very few with health care. Very few with shelter, and most had little to no food. And with no clear vision of the future, guess what happened? December 7, 1941, Japan attacked us at Pearl Harbor. Adolf Hitler was then overtaking Europe and giving speeches throughout the Europe saying, Today, Europe, tomorrow, the world. During World War II, the United States military sustained 292, 131,000 battle deaths. 115,000, 187 added to that of other deaths directly resulted from injuries from the war for a total of over 407,000 deaths for United States military personnel. And that was between 1941 and 1945. Over 68,000 men and women per year for six years suffered. Because so many of these soldiers and airmen and Marines and Navy died for our country, though, we were able to continue to sustain the right of self-determination of what kind of a nation that we wanted to be rather than a foreign nation coming in and deciding what kind of nation they wanted us to be after we had shed the blood to get where we were. Many of these men died for our country. The women died for our country. And as a result, we were able to sustain the right of self-determination to mark out and plot our own future rather than someone else. Do you want someone else marking out and planning your future for you? Who has no value that you have? I don't. That's not freedom. That's bondage. I want to talk about... a little bit here, but the right of self-determination. I was raised, our whole family was raised. We are independent cusses where I come from. That's the way I was raised. And that's the way my family was raised. And that's the way I raised my family. Not to be afraid, to take risks, to do what needed to be done, and to live in freedom rather than what someone says to you or what someone thinks of you. Don't live in fear. Don't live in fear. And I think God gave us a great strength through trial and error, bumbling, fumbling, stumbling, foot in mouth disease and everything, but I think God helped us through that. The right of self-determination to do what you want to do and to be what you want to be that does not infringe or nor is evil, God will bless. Does not infringe on the rights of others nor is evil. God will bless it. 
The right of self-determination is vital for us to have a future generation of free Americans. And they need to have that sense of of self-determination. Or they're going to sit down and they're going to sour, they're going to soak in their own pity, and they're going to turn sour. They're going to turn bitter. The right of self-determination includes the right to not only preserve your freedom way of life, but to never let an evil force take it from you. And to hold on to it anywhere there is a threat from somewhere else in the world that is threatening to come to your shores and take it from you. Go get it. Go get it. Because you don't, you won't have it. And somebody will come and get yours. Since our nation declared its independence from Great Britain in 1776 up to the, the estimates of 2019, America has lost 1,354,666 souls to war battle. That many people is how many people we have lost in war combat battle. Not just those who died of injuries after that, but since the Revolutionary War, we've lost almost 1.4 million men and women fighting to secure and to free what we have here. Not everything was perfect. A lot of stuff was ugly from time to time. We understand that. But God allowed it. If you go back and you look at the history of Israel when she conquered the other nations, when Joshua took his uh, the group of the faithful crossed the Jordan and they went in and conquered. They went into Jericho. They took every life, man, woman, even suckling babes and slaughtered them. So there would be no one who would next generation come out to avenge their parents. And they went to the next city and they did the exact same thing there. Because God told them to, that they were wicked, idolatrous nations, and they are going to continue their wicked wicked idolatry, and they will bring you down to nothing if you don't fight for it. And that's just the way it is. It doesn't seem like that's a very kind thing to do. The kind people get smushed every day. Kind people get crushed under the heel of tyrants every day. And if you're not as tough or tougher than they are, They will get you. You can't be a coward. Too many people have shed too much blood for us to be cowards in our generation. More than 40 million military and civilian deaths are attributed just to World War II. And these numbers do not include over 6 million defenseless Jews slaughtered by Hitler in Nazi Germany. I have heard preachers and church denominations and the public in general say the church should not speak of such things or focus on such things any time of year, and preachers in particular should not lead in such sermons in their congregations. I think they forget that a lot of preachers have loved ones who have died in war. A lot of preachers served in battle, and a lot of preachers served in the military, and a lot of people in their congregations who are tax-paying citizens who put those nuts in Congress in positions of authority, they forget that you've got children in the service or who may be going in. That you've got some skin in the game. I got a book in my library of those people who are the wealthiest in America, who had the least percentage of children in the military. They don't serve. It's the middle and low class that fills the majority of the positions in the military. And I was somewhere between the top of the low class to the bottom of the middle class, economically, coming from an old farm farm boy. Didn't have much. Again, I told you all, when I went through and I got my gear, when we went through the line and I got two sheets, I didn't know what the other one was for. I didn't know there was one supposed to go on the top. I thought it was just you and that wool blanket. That's what I was used to anyway. Two sheets? What have I done to deserve this? I didn't have to get up to 5.30. I was used to getting up at 4.30 because we had to milk. 5.30, you're sleeping in. Anyway, 
But I've heard preachers and church denominations and the public in general say the church should not say anything about these issues. That the church should stay silent and neutral on subjects such as war and national politics or policies. In other words, they are trying to tell you to shut up. At the same time, get on the campaign stump and preach freedom of speech. What hypocrites. And I call them cowards. They tell you in church and you as a Christian, keep your Bible sermon to yourself. Keep your verses of Scripture to yourself. They, they like to portray Christianity in such a way as that God has nothing to do with what goes on in the general life. Amazing. They're all going to stand in front of them and get judged one of these days. How is it that what they did in their life does not have effect on their judgment or their God? They portray Christianity in a doormat manner. They like to keep it that way. They like to keep Christianity in a like doormat people. And then they say, let the politicians and the military personnel handle world issues. I'm going to tell you who handles most world issues. Super wealthy people. Because they tell the military what to do. They tell corporations what to do. They tell commerce what to do. They tell Wall Street what to do. They tell people what to do. The people who have the money have the power. That's the way the world thinks. That's why Jesus cut it down to the common denominator that man cannot serve both mammon and God at the same time, or money. I'm always suspicious of those who tell me to look the other way or to keep the Bible out of the conversation regarding people's behavior. <laughs> because they don't want there to be known in the, on the general public what the moral standard is for human behavior. Because they're not adhering to it. Quiet now, as they sit on the Wizard of Oz, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. You know, he's back there shaking the curtains. And the dog, the, ball, the dog dropped a dime on him, pulled the curtain back. And there, there he was, cray cray, right there, shaking the curtains. For those who say that we're not to speak of these things in the church, they don't know the Word of God very well. They do not want to hear what God's Word has to say on the matter. That they prefer the Christian community be gutless so they can rule over us instead of Jesus Christ our Lord giving us a backbone. Well, I'm going to tell you, we worship God, not government. I love my country, but my God comes first. That's where my conscience comes from. And from that, you can do a lot more than just serve in your country. You can serve in your community. You can serve in your home. You can serve as a good example to other students if you're a young person. Those who say the church should stay silent on national security matters do not realize that our security is involved as well. They have forgotten why so many did come, not all perhaps, but so many did come here to start with in this nation. Whether they're still coming or not, many are coming for spiritual freedom from other nations. God can grant that. Those who say the church should stay silent on national security matters do not consider that many members of local churches have either been in the military or are directly related to those who have or currently serve, including many of its pastors. We have pastors in our community who carry the emotional, mental, and for some the physical scars of military service, and for some who have combat experience scars they still suffer from those. I know of one pastor here in Botetourt County who has so much shrapnel in his body from Vietnam that he cannot go through a metal detector without still setting it off. And he hurts every day physically and psychologically. And he hurts every time he steps into the pulpit, but there he is reminded that he bows his knee only to Jesus Christ. Our former pastor, Richard Frampton, Dr. Frampton, served as a military guard as an MP at an air base in the Marine Corps where he endured flight after flight of fighter jets taking off landing at Cherry Point, North Carolina in the 50s, 1950s. Cigarette butts is what he put in his ears. That's all they gave him, basically. There's ear canals. There's a little cilia. The hair were permanently damaged, but only when he got older did it completely give out on him. And he would often have no hearing protection. 
other than cigarette butts put in his ears. And due to the damage to his hearing because of that military service, he suffered for over 30 years with tinnitus. The ringing was so loud he couldn't hear you talk sometimes standing right in front of him. It just sounded like a back end of a jet in the side of his head 24-7 oftentimes. So much so that he had to be on such strong narcotics to survive, he had to be put in rehab from time to time just to bring him down off of that to put him on something else. The noise was so loud. There were occasions where he just thought he could not take it any longer, and yet he would find a way to come up here. And he did that for 20 of the last 34 years he was a pastor of this church, and he gutted it out. He did it. Semper Fi. He suffered from chronic ringing in his ears, sometimes so loudly that he had to be hospitalized because of medications he had to take to function, and the trauma that he went through in his mind and due to his military service, he dealt, he dealt with it. He kept dealing with it. But now he's with the Lord. Passed away three years ago. Yes, the Bible has a lot to say regarding our freedom. And a lot of people in the church have given the ultimate sacrifice over the years to make sure that it's secured. Or have lost loved ones. Or have the emotional, mental, and sometimes the physical trauma that follows service. So yes, we are so thankful then we're not ashamed to say it. But the Bible has a lot to say about all the different areas of our lives, whether it's our service or it's our money or it's our planning or it's our our, our, our behavior. The Bible has a lot to say because God cares about us. He cares about us. And the more we learn from the Bible, the more that we're sure of that. The Bible has a lot to say about military warfare. It has a lot to say about different ways of looking at warfare and different ways to honor those who have given the ultimate sacrifice. The Bible has a lot to say because God has spoken concerning these issues. As we saw in Romans 13, verses 1 through 7, we are to show respect and support those who defend our freedoms. We are to hold them accountable with their in service, those leaders, for their actions, but we're also to honor them for their service. And God, as I said, ordained human government for our benefit, our welfare, so that we might lead a quiet and basically peaceable life. But they're there to serve and to protect those within our borders and those outside of our borders. We're there to be on defense. I've taken the pledge twice, that oath of, that oath of service. Some of you I know took that oath of service to defend both at home and abroad. And those people, Linda can tell you that she's done uh, the people who have come into our nation and have become granted citizenship. And when they take that oath of citizenship, they're also given part of that oath of citizenship that they're willing to defend our nation. Better than half the people that was in my platoon were either African American or Hispanic. I want us all to understand that. Better than half the people, two of the men that was in my squad were Hispanic. And one was African American. And I was a little tiny white a farm boy. With a big mouth. Even as a 18 year old. And just no no sense of bridling anything other than saying, yes, sir, no, sir, to the drill sergeant. <laughs> we need to remember that. God ordained human government for our welfare. That those who rule in authority are supposed to do so for our good. And we need to know what good is. And that's why the Bible is so full of what is good. And we realize that they should rule effectively and when there is evil to put it down, whether it's domestically or internationally when appropriate. That those who must use force to suppress evil are considered, according to the Bible, ministers of God. That they do not bear their weapons in vain and that they are called on by God to execute His wrath upon people in a justifiable way. Not uh, uh, in a war crime way, but in a justifiable way. 
Today, for those who have given their lives, we remember them. We thank God for them. They will never hear our prayers. They will never hear our words of appreciation. They will never get a, they'll never have a living, breathing chest to pin a ribbon on. Or a medal loan. They'll never see the commendations. They'll never see their names on a wall. Because they're dead. Hopefully with the Lord. But God will hear us who are alive. He will hear us. When we pray and thank God for what they did, He will hear us. And we ask for His continued mercy and instruction and guidance from His Word and for His grace for our nation. If we will abide by His will, we will have that secured for us. And that's why I entitled this series, Let Freedom Ring. Let it ring. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be shy. If people are trying to turn you away from what it takes for us to be a free nation, set them straight. They don't mind sharing their stupid opinions with you. You share God's opinion. You are His ambassador. There are people who are trying to tell you such things today to cause you to... Now, Jesus tells us to turn the other cheek, but that has to do with dealing with people on a personal basis of not taking slights from people on a personal basis. Got nothing to do with defending yourself. If someone takes a swing at me for no reason, I'm not turning my other cheek. I'm turning into them. Because that's not what the context of that passage is about. So let's be careful when we're studying the Bible that we don't see Jesus Christ as some sort of a late 60s hippie. Because that's not at all what He was. He's God in the flesh. He's a man amongst men. We shouldn't look at our Savior as an effeminate hippie. He is a man among men. There is no greater man that ever graced the face of the earth than the Lord Jesus Himself. He's God in flesh. And He came and died for you and me. And I trust that you have received Him as your Savior. Because when you have, He gives you a conviction that gives you a, a jism in your heart that you cannot suppress. He puts a fire in your heart, but He also puts brakes on you when you need to have brakes on you too. But He does it with controlled Aggression. When you re- enter into Christianity, you enter into a violent religion. Can you think of how many people have been hated and despised in this world other than the Jew than Christians? No, there isn't. We're despised. The first 12 other than Judas Iscariot, other than John, who survived a burning oil pot at the hands of Emperor Domitian of Rome, they all other, the other ten died a violent death. Well, eleven, because Paul was added. They died a violent death. They were so hated. Jesus Christ died a violent death for you and for me. He did it so that you would have eternal life. So that you would know that your sins are forgiven and God receives you into His family. I trust that you will think about that. Are you born again? Have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? It's not about being a Baptist or any other denomination church. It's about you coming into a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. He will keep you and secure you a home in heaven. He will put your name in a book in heaven called the Lamb's Book of Life, and it will not be blotted out. He'll give you a citizenship and a homeland and make you an ambassador here while you're left with what time you have on this earth. Your orders are very clear. To walk the walk that He's given you and do the best that you can and leave the rest up to Him. And He will do what He says He'll do because He's always faithful. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this day, for the blessings in life that You give to us. We thank You for Your kindness and mercy. Thank you now for all these who've come out for this day.
whether it be a celebration the day before Memorial Day or just any regular Sunday, we're so thankful because we have a celebration on this first day of the week as Jesus also rose from the dead the first day of the week. We have this day where we can just shut our eyes in this prayer in this room and just say, Lord, I'm thankful for what you've done for me. I'm thankful for what you promised to me. And I want to know that I'm going to heaven when I die. I want to know that I'm not going to be stuck here in this world and then end up having a terrible eternity in a terrible place. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. I admit that I'm a sinner, that Jesus died for me, and I want to make him my Lord and my Savior. Heavenly Father, if there's anybody that needs to make that choice, they don't have to run the aisle or raise their hand. We're not going to ask them to do that. But in their heart, they can say, yes, God, I do believe and I do receive him as my Lord and Savior. And if they'll do that, if anybody needs to do that, your spirit will come in and start teaching their human spirit, which has been dead for so long, to the things of God. And start bringing things to thought and opening up an understanding of the Bible where it may not have been at all before. So we pray, Father, for anyone who's in the process of making that decision today that they will do so. And Father, we thank you for all the believers that are here who know you as their, your son as their Savior. We pray that you'll help us to have a backbone and to be good and gentle in the way that we present things, but to present them nonetheless. And though we don't know what people might say to us for sharing your word to the world, whether it's the grocery store or the school or the workplace or in the home, that we know that you're going to honor it, that you will not send it forth. It will accomplish that what you send it forth to do. Thank you again for this wonderful day and for these your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.